Barney Clark, 61 years old, a retired dentist. Not long ago, he told a friend, if I can do something for mankind, I will. Today, he made medical history as the first human to receive a permanent artificial heart. In December of 1982, doctors at the University of Utah removed a diseased and ailing heart from the chest of Barney Clark. His heart was really not pumping. It was just almost quivering. They replaced it with a man-made device, the Jarvik 7 artificial heart. It goes right where your heart would go in your chest. Clark survived the surgery, and the heart was hailed as a breakthrough in the fight against heart disease. The artificial heart is, in some important ways, stronger than the natural heart. I thought it was going to help a lot of people. I thought it was going to immediately take off. But complications with the artificial heart led to questions. Does it cause dangerous clots? Is the cost in suffering too high? More than three decades later, heart disease is still the leading cause of death in America. Did the device inspire artificial hope or real change? If you want to take out something that's bad and put something good in there, that's a win-win for everybody. At seven minutes after midnight, the heart was removed. Barney Clark was near death when doctors rushed him into surgery. He had end-stage congestive heart failure and was out of options. He was too old for transplant. He had no drugs that would help him. And the only thing he had uh, to look forward to was dying. Days earlier, Clark had agreed to have his heart replaced by a man-made one as part of an experimental study led by heart surgeon William DeVries. Most people would say, I want to live longer. But he said, I want to do something that may help the people that come after me. The pioneering surgery lasted seven and a half hours. And the whole team's up there. We wait till his heart stops, and then we put the heart in him. And then the heart starts beating, and we're all excited. I mean, it was intense, let me tell you. It was every fiber of my being was, was, was on full alert. Barney Clark is doing just fine tonight, but he's not out of the woods yet. He's breathing on his own and has spoken his first words since surgery. He wanted a glass of water. And when he woke up, he said, I, 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 this feels good, I'm glad I'm a beating. And then he looked at his wife and she leaned down and he said, I want to tell you that even though I don't have a heart, I still love you. And that, <clears throat> that wasn't a dry eye in the house. What does it feel like to have an artificial heart in the chest? Do you have pain or is it uncomfortable? Not at all. It's, it feels it's comfortable. The heart inside Barney Clark was called the Jarvik 7, named after its lead inventor, Dr. Robert Jarvik. We always have thought that it's clearly a benefit to the patient to do this. The Jarvik 7 was made of two pumping chambers attached by Velcro and powered by a large external air compressor. We believe it will serve a very large number of patients that cannot be reached with heart transplants. There just plain aren't enough donors. There are only about 2,000 heart donors a year, yet tens of thousands of patients who could benefit from a transplant. The Jarvik 7 was hailed as a medical miracle, and the media covered every update on Clark's condition. Well, by now, he's so familiar that he's just like a member of the family. I think he's uh, climbing a mountain. He's not to the summit yet. He had times when it was good, times when it wasn't good. He had trouble breathing. Five hours into the 13th day of the artificial heart, Dr. Clark had a sudden drop in blood pressure. He was mainly bound in the hospital, but uh, he could do more things with the heart than he could without the heart. This is a second chance at life for us, and we're very, very grateful. During that second chance, Barney Clark battled seizures, infections, and more. And nearly four months after receiving the artificial heart, he died. His lungs failed. Next, his brain failed. And lastly, when the key was turned off, his heart failed. When he died, I said to myself, OK, um, I know that everybody's going to look at this as just an event, and looking at it as possible just chance that it worked. We need to do it again. Good evening. The operation was a success. The patient is in stable condition. That's the word from Louisville, Kentucky tonight on William Schrader. 
In November of 1984, at Humana Heart Institute in Louisville, Kentucky, Dr. DeVries performed an artificial heart operation on a second dying patient, 52-year-old William Schrader. The results were dramatic. Fantastic. It's just a, a complete turnaround. Really. And, and how you feel? Or I can breathe. I feel like I got 10 years going right now. Well, we hope you do. Well, I already did. <laughs> Bill Schrader was incredible. I mean, he... We had him on television a lot. He wanted to talk to the TV. He loved talking to people. Who knows, may I be as by the uh, bionic man. In the days following his operation, Schrader felt good enough to tell jokes and drink a beer. He even asked President Ronald Reagan about his social security benefits. Just keep on calling and keep on calling and I don't get anywhere. I will get into it and find out what this situation is. He got his check the next day. But shortly after, Schrader had a stroke, and his recovery stalled. Schrader lost consciousness for almost an hour. He was paralyzed on his right side. But the major continuing deficit from the stroke is Schrader's speech. How are you feeling? I'm feeling real fine. He feels real fine. The heart is something that moves, the blood moves through it. And if you damage the blood too much, it will clot. That was a real medical problem. DeVries implanted artificial hearts in two more patients, but Schrader outlived them both and remained the center of media attention. Can you wave to everybody? Schrader had more strokes, and TV cameras documented his deteriorating health. He can barely speak, is partially paralyzed, and often doesn't recognize his family. With images like these broadcast across the nation, many began to question whether the artificial heart experiment was worth the suffering. William Schrader's been living with an artificial heart. Living, yes, but the quality of his life has not been at all as his doctors and family had planned. They've proven that you can prolong the dying process, but they certainly haven't proven that you can give anyone any type of reasonable quality of life. I'd turn on the news, read the newspaper, and there's really bad articles came out about this is bad, I was playing God, and they should have let him die. And if I really got upset, all I had to do was walk down the hall into one of the rooms. I'd say, do you really want us to stop? And boy, you'd say that, they, they, no, none of them said stop. William Schrader lived for nearly two years with his artificial heart. But after he died in August of 1986, the Jarvik 7 went from medical miracle to the Dracula of medical technology. Then, four years later, the FDA cited the heart's manufacturer for quality control and reporting violations. The government has withdrawn its approval of the Jarvik artificial heart. Dr. DeVries was told to destroy his remaining hearts. I had a whole bunch of, I had like about 10 of them. And I remember going into the office of the administrator of the hospital with a knife and cutting heart holes in their diaphragm so I could never use them again. That was probably the saddest day of my life. His study was over and the artificial heart faded from public view. But it didn't go away. More than two decades later, Randy Shepard's heart was failing so rapidly that he was in danger of dying at any moment. With no donor heart available, his doctor gave him another option, the artificial heart. I'm like, whoa, so you're cutting my heart out of my chest and sticking, basically making me a robot. I'm like, what's, the, what's plan B? I don't wanna do that. But Shepard did want to live, so he agreed to the surgery. The FDA had approved a different use for the artificial heart, not a permanent implant, but a temporary bridge to transplant. It was a way to keep patients alive while waiting for a donor heart. Shepard's recovery from the surgery was difficult, especially mentally. All of a sudden, my heart's gone and I've got a machine in there and it's like, wow. It was just a feeling of loss of like, not being a person, of not being a self. He lived with his artificial heart for 14 months, and now that he's had a heart transplant, he leads a normal, active life. I'm running, uh, trail running, lifting weights. So looking back at this point, I can say it absolutely is worth it. Without the artificial heart, I wouldn't be here. Would not have made it to transplant without the artificial heart. It's very exciting because I think things that couldn't be done in the 1980s can now be done uh, in patients who really need help. Today, what used to be called the Jarvik 7 is called the Syncardia Temporary Total Artificial Heart. 
It now comes in different sizes, so it can fit more women and children. Other than that, the device hasn't changed much since the days of Barney Clark. We have learned how to use it. There is no doubt that the device at that time was ahead of its time. The concept was ahead of its time. Doctors have learned how to control the blood clots and infections that plagued the early patients, and the artificial heart has now been used about 1,600 times as a bridge to transplant. Once the device is in and you turn it on, it's quite remarkable. They go from almost being dead to having what many people call a super heart. And with the development of smaller, portable power packs, artificial heart patients can even leave the hospital and live at home while waiting for a donor heart. I have two dogs, so I go out and I walk in the backyard with my dogs and I play with them. I say 99% of my days are great. Lance White has been waiting at home for nearly two years. The machine that powers his heart weighs about 13 pounds and can be carried in a backpack. Most of the time, I'm plugged up to the wall with that. Now, if I want to go somewhere, I can take it out and I can just have this with me. The machine makes a constant beating noise and is connected to the artificial heart by tubes, but he's not complaining. If that's the price I have to pay, so to speak, to do another 40, 50 years, to watch my kids grow up, to have grandkids, that's easy. With the success of the artificial heart as a bridge to transplant, doctors see a future once again for the device as a permanent implant, this time with the benefit of modern medical care. The FDA uh, have approved a trial which allows this total artificial heart to be the complete substitute for a heart transplant. And that's called a bridge to a destination, which means that this will stay with you until you die. At the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center, the very first patient in the trial recently received a permanent artificial heart, the first since doctors operated on Barney Clark, William Schrader, and others three decades ago. I think there's undeniable evidence now that it's been a big success in the long term. It works great. And they've had electric hearts and they've had all kinds of things that say this is better and better, but this heart is the only one that's really been used to consecutively all that time, and it's withstanded 30, 40 years now. 